Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is early in the new series entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. This is lesson number three entitled, Blueprint for a Better World. Make that lesson title, Sabbath, A Day of Freedom. It's the lesson for July 20 of 2019. And as always, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you here, asking your special guidance, the work of your Holy Spirit, to guide our thinking, our speech, and our presentation of what we have here in these lessons, so that many may be blessed, including ourselves, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that Sabbath was created at the end of that first creation week. It was created. Uh, and I, I like to think back, what was it like on that first Sabbath? Do you think there was a gathering, some kind of a special celebration? Because of, I mean, if God says it's very good, I suspect that a few of the angels thought it was good too. And they must have come down, and Adam and Eve, maybe they didn't realize that, I don't know, but they must have been the, the centerpiece of a great celebration. And we would like to suggest that uh, on that occasion, God not only created a day for rest, but he created the basic idea of rest. All that that means, that God is not only our creator, but will be our restorer. Do you think the angels wondered back in those first few days why God had created two kinds of beings instead of just one? I don't see why they wouldn't. Would be. <laughs> yeah. And yes. Why are they these two that look quite a bit alike, yeah. but not the same? Yeah. Isn't it obvious that God's definition of rest, in this case, does not just involve sleeping? What, what do you think is included in God's definition of rest? You ever stopped and asked yourself that question? from the labors of the rest of the week. Okay. Step aside from the rec re regular responsibilities of the week. Anybody want to ask anything, add anything more? Well, when you're talking about what Adam and Eve thought that first, you know, and the angels, you know, in spring, which we've just had, everything is brown and empty of leaves and whatever and all of a sudden you get those first blossoms and everybody's so excited there's pictures on Facebook of mm -hmm. all their you know it's exciting mm -hmm. and I, I view Sabbath as restoration yeah absolutely the uh, concept who? of uh, God well an attorney rests his case mm -hmm. I've proved everything he says mm -hmm. I've you know this is every this is all the evidence and God had presented his, evid his evidence to the universe okay. of what kind of God he was. Very good. Charles? Yeah, these were unfallen people, by the way. Mm -hmm. Holiness. There is rest in holiness. That's mm -hmm. what fascinates me. God, I'm sure, was the only one who had any idea on that day what was coming. And we know from Revelation chapter 7, the first four verses, and also in Revelation 14, that that Sabbath was going to end up being a sign, a sign of a seal that was going to take place when God's people, after that terrible fall and all the awful things that happened in between, after all that, it would be a sign that God's kingdom was going to be restored even more beautiful than it was at the beginning. Amazing. So, what do you suppose we will do when we get to that first Sabbath in the in heavenly kingdom. I think there might be some kind of celebration going on. <laughs> I think we'll start a book-by-book book series. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, I believe that folk from other inhibited world are going to come to see what's going on. This might seem crazy, but for someone who's not as young as I used to be, and I have a hard time remembering names, one of the things that will be exciting to me is I'll meet just hundreds and hundreds of new people and I'll remember all their names. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yeah. Well, so in light of that, 
suppose God could come to your church this Sabbath. What would he say to you about how to keep the Sabbath? Enjoy it. I wish you all could answer. It, Enjoy it? Is it keeping the Sabbath? Is that, to me, that there's some restrictiveness to keeping. Mm -hmm. um, enjoying the Sabbath. Enjoying the Sabbath. Good, I like that. Yeah, uh, Isaiah 58, 13, 14. If you call the Sabbath a delight, not yeah. waiting for the sun to go down, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just like the little kid enjoying that little last piece of sweet or whatever it is, you know, just yeah. having a fun in their mouth. What do you think the angels said to God after they returned to heaven? I presume they did. Uh, uh, on the evening, Adam and Eve needed sleep. Nobody else needed sleep, but uh, probably back to heaven. What do you think God, they, the angel said to God about, well, that was kind of nice. <laughs> what, do you, what do you suppose they, would, they said to God? It's been a super week. Yeah. Incredible a, a great, week. A great topper to it. Mm -hmm. Well, in our day, in our church, it's so easy when we talk about Sabbath to slip into talking about do's and don'ts. Is it all right to? Is it all right to? And when I hear somebody asking the question, is it all right to? I, I think of the king who lived in the high up in a mountain. I think it was in Germany and in, in medieval Germany and there was a very narrow road that went around this mountain up to the top of, of the mountain and um, he was looking for a new person to drive the carriage drive the horses and the carriage up this narrow way and so he announced that he was looking for somebody and three people showed up and he says he took them up part way up the hill and there was a steep bank on this side and then there was a road and that was pretty quickly dropped off on the other side and he said to the first guy, he said, uh, how close can you drive to the edge and still be safe? The guy, of course, thinking about the other two guys that were standing beside him, said, well, I think I can drive within a foot. And he looked at the next guy, he says, how close do you think you can drive? Well, of course, you know, he's got to do better than the other guy. Or he's not going to get the job, right? He said, well, I think I can do within six, six inches. And he came to the third guy and he says, how close do you think you can drive? He said, sir, he says, I think the only safe place on this road is as far away from the edge as possible. <laughs> and guess who got the job? You know, and, and that's what we need to think in terms of when people say, well, how close can I get to breaking the Sabbath? Well, well, people need to understand what holiness means. Yeah. You know. Uh, so maybe that's what God would preach about, would be holiness and how it relates to okay. the Sabbath. Because... Once you have that, the rest kind of takes care of itself. If you don't have that and you just have these rules to bind you in, then you're, you're empty. Mm -hmm. You don't have any. Some, one famous um, Jewish scholar called the Sabbath the queen of the week. And he said this, the, the, the blessings of the Sabbath should spill over into all the other days of the week. Is that the way you think about the Sabbath? Well, we know that on Mount Sinai, God asked the children of Israel to remember the Sabbath. Now, let's think about what that might imply. We know that Abraham, when he came out of Ur, God told him, okay, 400 years, this land will be yours. And we know the sequence. About 200 years later, roughly, they went down into Egypt. And, of course, when they first got down there, they were, they were welcomed. I mean, here was Joseph, and everybody was excited about it, and all the wonderful things you've done, and so forth. But it wasn't too long before they were forced into slavery, because they were big, they were multiplying, and they were strong, and, and the Pharaoh said, well, these people might not be always so friendly. So when do you think, in that sequence there, when do you think they started having trouble keeping the Sabbath? when they were forced into slavery, almost certainly at that point. Do you think it might have been a problem before that? No, because they were shepherds, so they were separated. The Egyptians mm -hmm. didn't like shepherds. and So they were given the land of Goshen to shepherd their flocks. So they pretty much had their own community. And as long as the community 
supported the idea it, it would have gone on. It's very interesting when you look back at the history and read carefully, very carefully what Ellen White says. That restriction about the Egyptians not associating with Israelites came from, do you know, do you remember? From Abraham's contact with... From the, Abraham's contact with the Egyptians. When he went lying. down there and he lied about Sarah and the, the Pharaoh was about to take over his wife and he said, oh, she's not your sister, she's your wife. He said, get these people out of here. And he says, we Egyptians won't have anything more to do with shepherds. Can you believe that God turned that bad thing into a good thing? If he hadn't, if that hadn't happened, I suspect that the children of Israel would have just faded into Egyptian society. Well, the next thing we, next chance we have to talk about the Sabbath, of course, was the experience with the manna, as the Hebrews would say. We say manna. Um, what was the story of the manna? You got enough every day to support you, and on Friday you picked a double dose. Okay, well, what was happening really is that they were running out of food that they had brought with them from Egypt. Yeah. So who's going to feed a couple million people? <clears throat> uh, let's see, did we think about this before we left Egypt? Uh, you know, and they started wondering, you know, there's, where's the water, where's the food? I have a lot more questions that I need to ask God about that whole thing. Who fed their animals? Did the animals eat manna? What did they eat? Why not? It was perfect food. Uh, yeah. Does that mean that for 40 years they got no fruits and no vegetables? If you have the perfect fruit, food, why do yeah. you need something more? Well, I ask, the question I would ask you is this. No matter how good this, the food is, if God says, okay, this is the only thing you get to eat for the next 40 years, would you be happy? I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> he's good with leftovers now, but he's not always been so good with leftovers. Okay. Well, at the point of inception, it, the, only God knew that it was going to be 40 years. Yeah. Uh, the plan was to go up there, you know, and, yeah. and then the spies went out, and then then they had to wander for 40 years. Yeah. So they kind of brought it on themselves. Yeah. It, it was a short. It was initially a shorter term yeah. plan. Now they had enough food for what they thought they were going to yeah. need. Well, they spent a year at the foot of Mount Sinai. From the, the foot of Mount Sinai, even with their rel relatively slow progress with that big crowd, they could have been in the land of Canaan in two weeks. Two weeks. Instead, it was 40 years. Well, it's interesting to note that the Hebrew word manna means, what is it? How <laughs> would you like to eat? What is it for 40 years? Did the, you think they ever got any other names for it or they all, just, all of them just called it, what is it? And how did they figure out what to do with it? Well, you know, it talks about pounding it and grinding it and boiling it. And boiling it, it melted, I think, didn't it? I mean, this was yeah. It says, it says if, they, if it was still out there when right. the sun came up, it melted. It melted, right. Well... So that Here's, raises the question, even in our minds, what is it? Or yeah. what was it? You know. So that's an apropos name. Dr. Maxwell used to talk about a pet bird that they had that they got somewhere. I think he said they caught it in the yard or whatever. But apparently it was a hybrid. A couple of different bird species that are fairly close together had, had bred together. And it, it had a pattern of, on, of its colors and so forth that... Nobody had any idea what what it belonged to, so they they called it manna. <laughs> well, let me read about so, what this. So, if manna was anything like potatoes, how many ways can you fix a potato? Yeah. Oh, you're right. You know, you can boil it, you can bake it, you can fry it, you can eat it raw, you can do all sorts of things. Yeah, it's true. Well, here's what it says in Exodus 16, verses 16 to 18. The Lord has commanded that each of you is to gather as much of it as he needs, two liters for each member of his household. That's about two quarts for each member of his household. The Israelites did this, some gathering more, others less. When they measured it, those who gathered much did not have too much, and those who gathered less did not have too little. Each had gathered just what he needed. How did that work? Did the so angels does that mean that me being lazy, I would still get enough food? 
Well, I hope I, you, I was hoping a, you wouldn't ask that. If question. I only pick a little bit of manna. <clears throat> well, the question is: Did did God just all of a sudden say whoop, and all of the but all the buckets were equal, or whatever they were carrying, were equal amounts, or did the angels come along and say, "You got more than you need"? Or anyway, did they just share with one another. Okay, it doesn't say that, but that's a no, good question. No, but it doesn't yeah. say the angels yeah. move things around either. Yeah. Well, Paul used that as interesting illustration in Second Corinthians eight verses ten to fifteen, when he was trying to encourage the people in. Asia, in, in Greece, basically, in Macedonia, to donate money to support the people back in Judea, that fateful trip that where he got arrested and so forth. Um, and he said that if you are generous like this and you give, then someday those people are able to give back to you or maybe even the Lord himself will repay you. Is that, uh, is that always true? If we give to the Lord, he repays? And th- we get everything from the Lord. Does that if everybody did God's will, then that's how it would work out. Okay. But so we don't dare do this if not everybody's doing it. No, I'm just uh, saying that much of what happens would be better if everybody did God's will. Ah, yes, that was true. But uh, the fact is that it, people don't, mm-hmm. and uh, so things fall apart. On our first trip back from Africa, we had been working for four years in Zambia, we stopped for a few days in Egypt and met with the Adventist people there. And we happened to hit it just right, and they had fresh watermelons in, in, in Egypt. They, those watermelons were so sweet, I could not believe it. Just amazing. And it doesn't surprise me that after a while, the people in, out there in the desert said, oh, we just wish we had some more of those melons. Well. Well, manna was better than watermelon. Well, uh, I hope so. I'm sure it was probably more nutritious. Well, one of the other interesting things is, what happened if you tried to keep some overnight? It spoiled. It spoiled terrible. It, it was stunk and it got worms and so forth. So every night, you had to, your, your pantry was empty. You had to assume you were going to get enough the next morning to be able to eat again. Does that teach anything about trust? Yes. It should. (laughs) It should, yeah. So the children of Israel were told to remember the Sabbath. And I'm not Sani. And what... I'm, I'm trying to again put myself in that situation. God says, remember the Sabbath day and those people out there, remember, had been in Egypt all those years, and most of them had grown up after that. It was easy, no longer easy, to keep the Sabbath, if any of them were even able to. What do you, what do you suppose came in their minds when God says, "Remember the Sabbath"? Um, but while you're thinking about that, let me ask another question: Why does God ask us to cook and prepare everything for Sabbath? On the day before, oh. uh, Myra, this should be your question. Yeah, I was going to say I would answer that so that I don't have to be slaving while you guys are enjoying church. Exactly, exactly. Very, and that's exactly why God asks us to the Sabbath to start at sundown on Friday evening, so you can't even cook until the middle of the night and work and work your tail off, and then you get up in the morning and, whew. But that's why they're microwave ovens. I see. So well, that you only have to slave for a bit instead of all day. I, I see. Yeah, that's why there are also these uh, stoves that are Sabbath. It's programmed there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So minimal work, you know, yeah. pre- even pressing the button. But you asked something very interesting about um, uh, remember. Mm-hmm. You see, so when they came out of the bondage, that was Sabbath to them. Mm-hmm. Really. I mean, hey, yeah. listen. Exactly. No more uh, making so many bricks per day and no supplies of straw exactly. or whatever. Right? So remember, and then goes back to, see, this is the background. You didn't know about it, but six days the Lord made the entire uh, yep. the, the world, you see, and uh, and he rested on the Sabbath. So it was, 
And that's why the Sabbath to be a delight is so beautiful. So yes. Beautiful expression. Let it be a delight. Well, of course, you remember the rest of that commandment. Uh, we'll focus just on, not read the, all of the Ten Commandments, but Let read just the one thing. thing. Yeah. Moses had not been a slave. No. Moses had been a king, and then he'd been out in the wilderness. Did he keep the Sabbath before, we before presume. leaving we uh, hope so. Egypt? We assume so. Mm -hmm. So probably he was telling them about it. You know, this is what it was like when we were doing what we were supposed to. There you go. And let's do it again. Well, look at verse 11 in, in chapter 20 when it talks about the Sabbath. This is his explanation. In six days I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in it, but on the seventh day I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Clearly, excuse me, clearly this fourth commandment has more explanation in it than any of the other commandments by far. Well, the interesting thing is if you jump over to Deuteronomy 5 and you see when Moses is now about to climb Mount Pisgah and disappear for heaven after dying and being resurrected, he gave them another explanation here in, in Deuteronomy 5. And if you read verse 15, his explanation for keeping the Sabbath is, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So the Sabbath isn't for remembering creation. It's for remembering that we were slave for, slaves in Egypt. Well, it's for both. Okay. So I was thinking about that this evening. And, and if we think of a commandment as do this, don't do that, most of the commandments don't have an explanation. Mm -hmm. Only two through five have explanations. And so the basic commandment is not changed between the two. It's only the explanation, mm -hmm. uh, the extra stuff. So um, another interesting fact is that uh, you know, there's a there was a manuscript in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was a Hebrew manuscript that had the uh, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth tacked on to the to the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, it was the end of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy yeah. 5. Or the end of Deuteronomy 5. Right. It was in the fourth cave at Qumran, uh, mm -hmm. but it was the 14th manuscript of Deuteronomy. So it mm -hmm. was, but, and that might seem, you know, maybe maybe somebody was a little overzealous and thought they would just bring it, add it on there because the whole thing, uh, you know, all of what Moses said was mm -hmm. important. Wow. So I don't know. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls came to L.A. and I went down there, they had a section called the Ten Words, which is what we would call the Ten Commandments, and it was all the Deuteronomy scroll. Their version of the Fourth Commandment also had this tacked on at the end. So mm -hmm. they must have uh, had some importance that they uh, attributed to the fact that this was added on in that one, mm -hmm. one uh, um, document. document. If you look at the, the way the Ten Commandments, I understand it in Hebrew, if you look at uh, Young's literal, it's a, thou dost not do these things. Thou dost, in other words, looking forward to how the righteous, those that do the right thing, won't be doing those things. Mm -hmm. Rather than a, a, a prohibition, it's not so much a prohibition, it's a You shall a not, you will not. It's a prescription yeah. as a, rather than a proscription. And it's mm -hmm. also a description mm -hmm. of how people will live. So you're suggesting, and, and I would agree absolutely, that what is happening here is God says, you need to celebrate me not just because I created you, but now that I've rescued you from slavery. I want to rescue you from sin. That's an even bigger, more exciting thing. Well, that's remember in John fifteen fifteen, I no longer call you slaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, and right. it was slaves to who? It wasn't to the Romans. No, you're not slaves to sin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, think of the kinds of worship that the, the Israel's, Israelites might have been exposed to in Egypt. Here are these big chunks of, most of them were stone, maybe some metal, maybe some wood, we don't know for sure. And people were bowing down. And what kind of response did they get from their gods? Zero. I mean, they could claim that, you know, the gods would send the, Nile, the floods in the Nile River. They could claim that 
all kinds of stuff, but there was no proof. No proof at all that any of these gods did anything. I mean, uh, you know. So, I wonder if any, any of them managed to still keep the Sabbath during those years of slavery, and if so, what was that like? Um, today, we think that salvation is all about God's saving us, taking us to heaven, bringing us back to this earth, etc. Do you think uh, any of the children of Israel had any understanding of the plan of salvation back at that point? The plan of salvation that we, we, we talk about today? I doubt it. What do you think salvation meant to them? Just escaping from the Egyptians? It was probably all they could think probably. of is how do I get out of this situation? As far as we know, they didn't have the tabernacle. That hadn't come down yet. So it was pretty no. basic, I would think. Yeah. Well, one of the things that God said to them very clearly in Deuteronomy 6 is, you need to teach your children. What do you need to teach your children? Tell them about what it was like in slavery. Tell them about how you got out of slavery. Tell them about the plagues. Tell them about the exodus and all the things that God has done from you. And not only that, tell them about the God you worship. So they were supposed to teach their children not just teaching them, okay, sit down, we're going to have a session now to teach you. But they were supposed to be teaching in in the course of everything they did all day long. That yeah. reminds me of um, when they crossed the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. They also put stones there. Yes. And their children will ask, what's this about? Exactly. Tell them. Same, same idea. Same idea. Exactly. Well, um, God asked them not just to remember, but he remember said he said, I'm going to give you a special time to remember. And what do we call that time? We call that the rest. Or in Hebrew, the Sabbath. Right? So, let me ask you here. I wish I could ask you out, all out there, but I can't do that. Has the keeping of the Sabbath made you better, kinder, more caring, more compassionate toward others? What has the keeping of the Sabbath done for you? Well, well, it gives us a chance to draw closer to God without some of the distractions. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. God, really, that makes us kinder and gentler. And so okay. it's an opportunity for transformation to, to behold him and be transformed by, uh, by him. It's interesting to notice, and let's just jump back there really again, really quick. In the commandment, I'll just pick the one from Deuteronomy. Look at who it focuses on. On that day, no one is to work, neither you nor your children, your slaves, your animals, not the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. So who is the focus on there in that? The underprivileged. Okay. Well, Sigve Tonstadt has made a suggestion in his book um, about the lost meaning of the seventh day. Gary, I think you have some words about that. Deuteronomy 15, 1 to 11? No, the bend back on tw number 22, I think it is. I, got I think it starts on the other page. Yeah, I didn't realize I had. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. It is clear that the Sabbath commandment is much longer and gives a great deal more detail than any other of the commandments. Why did God need to give all those details? Couldn't he just have commanded them to keep the Sabbath? Why do you think the commandment focuses on those who are lower in the chain of authority? Were they more likely to be required to work on the Sabbath even while the heads of households were resting? The Sabbath commandment prioritizes from the bottom up and not from the top down, giving first considerations to the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. Those who need the rest the most, the slave, the resident alien, and the beast of burden, are singled out for special mention. In the rest of the seventh day, the underprivileged, even mute animals, find an ally. Wow, that's wonderful. 
So God says, in this special time, this resting time, this is our time for fellowship, a special fellowship, for our time to, to get together. Even the foreigners are supposed to be permitted to just participate like they are just one of the Jews. So how different do, you, different do you suppose that was from the way the other Middle Eastern nations worshipped their gods in those days? Really different, I'm sure. And how they treated their slaves and yeah. uh, their servants. So the Sabbath was a kind of equalizer. Do we think of the Sabbath as an equalizer? Don't, you know, among Christians, we're supposed to be the 144,000, right? Aren't we supposed to be singled out for special privileges? Or could, the, could we even have an equalizer? I mean, we're supposed to be way up there among the, the hoi polloi, right? Jesus says not to seek the higher place. He says <laughs> seek the lower places. Okay, thank you very much. Well, the Sabbath was meant to be a time of rest and celebration for the entire universe. We need to remember, however, that as far as we know, this particular world is the only one that has a Sabbath just like ours. Maybe there's other places that have Sabbaths. We just don't know. But the Sabbath we know about is the one that, because we're talking about the, the, the rate of speed of, of turning of our world. Often, unfortunately, the Sabbath has been viewed as something very restrictive of human tradition, through human tradition and rules. In the, the ancient Jews had 600 rules or something like that for keeping the Sabbath. And Jesus opposed all those restrictions very vigorously. So now we need to ask in light of that another question. Why did Jesus apparently, apparently, I'm, I can't prove this, he didn't just say this, but he apparently chose to do some of his most important miracles on the Sabbath when he knew perfectly well it was for what he was doing was forbidden by the Jewish rules. I What's think it? he had two intentions. Number mm -hmm. one, well, he needed to do good. So, number two, I think he was poking at those Pharisees and others. He says, hey, listen, this is man-made stuff. Yeah. Or the, uh, then we go to um, Mark chapter 2, verse uh, 27, 27 28. 28. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Yeah. Sabbath is to be delight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen White had some very interesting words about that, um, about Jesus' behavior and his healing process. Uh, Charles, I think you've got some words on that. Sure. The people of Nazareth knew that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by Satan. About them were whole villages where there was not a moan of sickness in any house, for he had passed through them and healed all their sick. The mercy revealed in every act of his life testifies to his divine appointing, anointing. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 241. Wow. Imagine someone just passes through the town and everybody who's sick gets healed. Well, it would be wonderful if we had several hours to review all those major miracles that he performed. I can just give the references, Matthew 12, 9 to 15, Mark 1, 21 to 28, Luke 4, 38 to 39, 13, 10, verses 10 to 11, 14, colon, 1 to 6, John 5, 1 to 18, 9, 1 to 41. So that's a pretty significant chunk of the gospel stories if, in all four of those gospels if you take those stories. And those are the miracles, the healings on Sabbath. Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, well, these were all emergencies, right? It's all we're allowed to do. <laughs> there was only one of them that might have been an emergency. That was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. All the rest of them were people with years of disease. So Jesus intentionally, I think we have to say that, he intentionally went and healed these people on the Sabbath. Is that, was that the right thing to do? Well, look, let's just review those. There was the, the man who was par had a paralyzed hand that came to the 
the synagogue. There was a man with the evil spirit who came to the synagogue. There was a woman who had an evil spirit that caused her to be bent over for 18 years. There was a man whose legs and arms were swollen. There was a man who had been ill for 38 years. And there was a man who was born blind. I mean, how many years was that? And all these healings happened on the Sabbath. And how did it make the Pharisees feel? No the rules were being stepped on. Yeah. And they, from the very first... I, I can't believe it. if you read John chapter 2 is at the end of chapter 1 or begin chapter 2 his very first Passover he already had performed things that made the Pharisees so angry that they wanted to kill him I mean his ministry has hardly started well look at another occasion we're told John five eighteen. Dennis this saying made the Jewish authorities all more the more determined to kill him not only had he broken the Sabbath law, but he had said that God was his own father. And in this way, he made himself equal with God. This is from the Good News Translation. Wow. John 5.18. Well, one of the things is obvious. If you keep the Sabbath correctly, you're freed from your responsibilities of the rest of the week. And if you're freed from your responsibilities, what do you do? You do what you think is important, right? What you want to do, what you think is important at that time. So, what do we know about the focus that we should have about the Sabbath? Gordon? Ellen White uh, wrote, and probably the first reference was Signs of the Times in 1876. She wrote, According to the fourth commandment, the Sabbath was dedicated to rest and religious worship. All secular employment was to be suspended. But works of mercy and benevolence were in accordance with the purpose of the Lord. To relieve the afflicted, to comfort the sorrowing, is a labor of love that does honor to God's holy day. So it would be all right to do that on Sabbath? be okay to have a clinic. Yeah, what about that? Uh, to me, it calls for a healthy balance. Okay. Uh, the, in folk in the medical field, uh, the, 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 there has to be a uh, oh. uh, healthy balance. I, I, I try to heal people all day, every day. Should I just keep doing that on Sabbath? No. You need um, a break. Unless it's an emergency and you're out in the middle of the desert or somewhere. Well, sometimes we suggest that the Sabbath is, is an opportunity to reach out to others. But the Israelites were in a pretty solid organization. They stuck together pretty much. Um, if you're in Jerusalem, living in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, how many foreigners were there around that you could evangelize? Fewer than in Loma Linda. <laughs> well, in our last lesson, we talked about the Jubilee, let's, Jubilee year. Let's talk about some other aspects of Sabbath. In this lesson, we're going to focus on not only the seventh day Sabbath, but also the seventh year Sabbath. Uh, Myra, I think you have some words about that. Leviticus 25, 1 to 7. This is from the Good News Bible. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai and commanded him to give the following regulations to the people of Israel. When you enter the land that the Lord is giving you, you shall honor the Lord by not cultivating your land every seventh year. You shall sow your fields, prune your vineyards, gather your crops for six years. But on the seventh year is to be a year of complete rest for the land, a year dedicated to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not harvest the corn that grows by itself without being sown. And do not gather the grapes from your unpruned vines. It is a year of complete rest for the land. Although the land has not been cultivated during that year, it will provide food for you, your slaves, your hired men, your foreigners living with you, your domestic animals, and the wild animals of, in your field. Everything that it produces may be eaten. Now, if you notice this just carefully, it almost seems like a contradiction. Because it says you're not supposed to harvest your corn, and yet it says everyone can go in there, take what they need, and eat it. 
Now that's not an, is that a harvest or not a harvest? Well, it says don't eat the corn that grew even the when you didn't, corn. yeah, the volunteer corn that you didn't even. And the volunteer but then grapes. then it says everything can be eaten. Okay. So it seems like the contradiction here, which, is, well, not really a contradiction, is just, you're not supposed to go out in an organized way and harvest what's growing there. It's a, time, it's a place for everybody to go in and help themselves when they need some. There it is. Help yourself. So what does a year of rest do for the land? Reconstitutes itself. Reconstitutes itself. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. The, the, the ground is a living entity? Well, Full of living entities. Full of living entities. Okay. I can remember, I grew up in a country, part of the country, where there was a lot of growing of wheat and oats and so forth like that. And especially the Christian farmers often would rotate. I, yes. I guess it was all right to do that. So this field stays fallow this year, and the next one field sta stays fallow another year, and fall forth like this. So I guess, does that count, or do you have to let all your fields ha go, ready fa go fallow at the same time? Uh. Well, if you're going to rest, quote, rest also, then you have to really um, allow the land to do its own thing. Mm -hmm. Do we have any records in the Old Testament where the whole nation apparently did that? No. Nope. None that we can identify. So it's hard to know whether they ever really did it or not. But, but I think somewhere, in, I must have got the idea from here, somewhere reading this, that that when they went into captivity, God said, uh, now the Sabbaths will get their their rest, that they mm -hmm. didn't, you didn't give them or words to that effect. The fields will give their rest. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Well, so it implies that they didn't. Uh, of course, they were in apostasy. That's why they went into, into uh, captivity. So, Do you think there were individual Israelites who followed these instructions? In the days of Elijah, there were how many people who 7, were? 7,000. 7,000 who had not bowed, bowed the knee to Baal. Well, having a sev Sabbath... Elijah thought he was the only one. Yeah. Having a Sabbath year every seven years allowed the farmland to lie fallow for the year. It has been recognized by many authorities that this is a very beneficial effect on the land. So, maybe we should be doing that. Rick, also on the... Yeah? I was going to say they recommend it today right here in the state. Yeah. Also on the seventh year, every Israelite slave was to be released. Outstanding debts were also to be forgiven. I think it says something about that, Deuteronomy 15. Jim? Does that include student loans? <laughs> well, I don't know. Mortgages? <laughs> Depends on how you vote. <laughs> the system used to work on that, on that issue up until about 1999 when they changed the bankruptcy code on that. Yeah, so uh, you used to be able to bankrupt. Anyway. Deuteronomy 15, 1 to, 1 to 11. At the end of every seventh year, you are to cancel the debts of those who owe you money. This is how it is to be done. All who have lent money to a fellow Israelite are to cancel the debt. They must not try to collect the debt. Excuse me, collect the money. The Lord himself has declared the debt canceled. You may collect what a foreigner owes, owes you, but you must not collect what any of your own people owe you. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that he is giving you. Not one of your people will be poor. If you obey him and carefully observe everything that I command you today, the Lord will bless you as he has promised. You will lend money to many nations, but you will not have to borrow from any. You will have control over many nations, but no nation will have control over you. If any of the towns in the land that the Lord your God is giving you there is a fellow Israelite in need, then do not be selfish and refuse to help him. Instead, be generous and lend him as much as he needs. Do not refuse to lend him something just because the year when he, the debts are canceled are the year when debts are canceled is near. Do not let such an evil thought enter your mind. If you refuse to make the loan, 
He will cry out to the Lord against you, and you will be held guilty. Give to him freely and unselfishly, and the Lord will bless you in everything you do. There will always be some Israelites who are among you, or excuse me, who are poor and in need, and so I command you to be generous to them. Wow. You don't, you know, how many people are going around in the middle of the sixth year saying, how much money can I borrow? Yeah. Well, do you think some Israelites lost a lot of money because of this provision? No, it says you do this and I bless you. Mm-hmm. Bring in the tithe and I bless you. Certainly, if they had done this, if everybody had done this, the whole society would be blessed. Yes, right. The the bottom wouldn't have fallen out. Yeah, I, think of it in terms of especially the the poorer people would have always been brought up. Whether mm-hmm. the other ones got ahead, uh, that wasn't really the plan. It was more that things would be evened out. That was kind of an antidote for self-centeredness, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, what difference should keeping the Sabbath make to our the other six days of the week? If you're greedy, selfish, uncaring from Sunday through Friday, does it really matter what you do on Sabbath? No. <laughs> Doesn't our real character shine out on the Sabbath just as it does in other days? It may manifest itself in slightly different ways, but it's still there. So, what should we do on the Sabbath? Jesus stated to them that the work of relieving the afflicted was in harmony with the Sabbath law. It was in harmony with the work of God's angels who are ever descending and ascending between heaven and earth to minister to suffering humanity. God could not for a moment stay his hand or man would faint and die. And man also has a work to perform on this day. The necessities of life must be attended to, the sick must be cared for, the wants of the needy must be supplied. He will not be held guiltless who neglects to relieve suffering on the Sabbath. God's holy rest day was made for man and acts of mercy are in perfect harmony with its intent. God does not desire his creatures to suffer an hour's pain that may be relieved upon the Sabbath or any other day. And that's from Desire of Ages, page 206 to paragraph 3 through 207.1. Thank you. There's a passage, of a, a brief statement that I just love from uh, the Review and Herald. It was 1892, about 1890, somewhere in there like this, where she, Ellen White says, every heartbeat is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Every heartbeat. How much are we dependent upon God? Let's see. How often do our hearts beat? Yeah, pretty well total, isn't it? Yeah. If our job is to relieve the pain of those who are suffering, does that mean doctors should use more pain medication on the Sabbath? Or hold more clinics on the Sabbath? Or hold more clinics on the Sabbath? Well, I know there's. I, I know a, a surgeon who's not working anymore but I know a surgeon who used to try to go in a little bit early on Sabbath and he would make more or less private rounds and he would sit on the edges of the beds of his patients and talk to them about the things that was going on and a little bit about their problem and what the meaning of life was to him and so forth and it did marvelous things for his patients well so Does the world need to be reminded that we have a creator and a restorer and a savior? Yes. How many of the people in the world have any idea about that? Did those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that we read about in Exodus 16, did did each person end up with a portion of manna appropriate for his needs? That's what it says. Does that mean that nobody was skinny and nobody was fat? Who decided how much each person should get? Sounded like what, God did. What if we could do that today? Hmm. You mean I could eat all everything I want and not gain weight? <laughs> that wasn't quite what I. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, you mean I would eat the right amount and exercise the right you amount? You might have to, to eat the right amount and exercise. Slim right and trim, huh? To get so slim and trim. A huge study just came out. 
from, and I don't remember who, what group published it, but they, they studied people all over the world, all over the world in different situations. Thousands and thousands of people were included in the study. And when they came to a conclusion after very carefully analyzing the thing, they said, the most thing, dangerous thing we do is not smoking, not drinking, not our other activities. The most dangerous thing we do is what we put in our mouths. And yet we have to do some. We have to do some. That's part of the problem. Well, in some of the more developed nations of the world today, there's a huge amount of food wastage. Some 40% of all the food bought annually in the United States ends up being wasted. Some 35 million tons. Doesn't that hint at the fact, as God has said, if nobody ate too much and if the food was distributed fairly, that everyone would have enough to eat? How many people could be fed with 35 million tons of food? Mm. Well, God made provision, it says, for the widows, the orphans, and the poor to at least have something. Uh, Charles? Yes, Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. When you harvest your fields, do not cut the corn at the edges of the fields. And do not go back to cut the ears of the corn that were left. Do not go back through your vineyard to gather the grapes that were missed or to pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor people and foreigners. I am the Lord, your God. I think I can remember the story of a, a son of a Canaanite woman who did some of that. Do you remember that story? Yes. Ruth? In the book of Ruth. Yeah, Boaz was the son of Rahab, and he married, so he was the son of a Canaanite prostitute, and he married a Moabite woman, and all of them ended up being ancestors of Jesus. Hmm, what can we learn from that? When you were a missionary, did you see them doing this? In uh, If you got to watching them harvesting? Uh, some countries, they still do. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Some countries, yeah, I don't they think still I've, do. I've seen that, but yeah. This is kind of like another version of what we were talking earlier about fellow, fellow mm -hmm. paddocks. It's the yeah. same idea. Yeah. Well, some people will bring extra, you know, bag, bags of oranges or apples or whatever to gatherings and people then can take them yep. from there. Yep. We have a wonderful situation like that that happens in our Sabbath school class. Yes. Well, in Matthew 6, there was an experience in which a lot of people were hungry. And what did Jesus do? Maybe we should read that. Matthew six thirty four. So do not worry about tomorrow. It will judge... It will have enough... I'm sorry. Um, it's further down here. Anyway, you know the story. Looks like I have a yeah, wrong... I think that is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. Yeah. It would be... Oh. So... Oh, yeah, okay. And it talks about feeding people. Yeah. Okay, but the part, the story I was jumping ahead is the, the next one in, in Luke 12. And Jesus told them this parable is once a rich man who had the land, all this land, I'm sorry, this is another story about the guy who harvested too much and built bigger barns and what happened to him? This night your soul is going to be taken. Yeah. Is it clear in your mind exactly how we are to prepare on preparation day for the Sabbath and then enjoy the Sabbath? Myra, are you excited about enjoying the Sabbath? Yes. Now, I wasn't so much when my children were little. Yeah. So what principles should guide us in the use of the Sabbath time? We do not have the capacity to perform miracles, as Jesus did, but we could bring comfort and cheer to those who are suffering. And so we think about another one of Jesus' miracles recorded in John 9. And at the end of that passage, remember the, the man was born blind and he was healed by Jesus. And the Pharisees found out about it and lo and behold, we discover it was done on the Sabbath and they were very upset. And at the end of that story, the blind man comes over and he runs into Jesus. In fact, Jesus finds him. And Jesus says, what do you think of the Son of Man? And he says, who is he? I don't who that is and then he said hey I'm the one and immediately I'm sure by hearing his voice he recognized the man and then Jesus made some comments we have those recorded um, 
John 9, 39 to 41. Dennis, I think yes, that's yours. this is a good news Bible. Jesus said, I came to this world to judge so that the blind should see and those who should uh, who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, Surely you don't mean that we are blind too? Jesus answered, If you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you see, this means that you are still guilty. Hmm. And so... Uh, Again, we're reminded of Leviticus, and I see we're running down on time. I'm going to skip over Leviticus 25, 39 to 46. Gordon, sorry. Um, but it's clearly there what? It says you're supposed to help your Israelite friends, your relatives, the people who live around you, but you can keep foreigners, and you can keep their children as slaves, right? That's what it says. Is God favoring the Jewish people here because of maybe his friend Abraham? Was that fair? Well, how, how were slaves treated in the countries around Israel? Very well. How were the Israelites treated in Egypt? Yeah. Now we've studied some of the details about all three of the Sabbaths, the daily, the yearly, and the Jubilee Sabbaths. What about those whose jobs during the week is healing? Some early Adventist doctors felt that they should not charge for services they rendered on the Sabbath. That would be nice, right? Guess what? Pretty soon, more and more of their patients wanted to be treated on the Sabbath. Yeah. So that didn't work out too well. Other doctors have suggested, well, maybe we should collect the regular fee for, worship on the, uh, for working on the Sabbath, but we should pay a double tithe. Does that seem like the right thing to do? Or should we collect whatever the usual fee is and give it all to the church? Well, that's a challenge for those of us who work in the healthcare industry. I mean, what's fair? What's, I mean, you don't want to, I mean, obviously all of us who are in the business, I think if we, if we face an emergency, we would do what needed, what we thought needed or what we could do, what we thought needed to be done at that point in time. But, are we comfortable just treating people who is in an emergency? Gordon? Jesus healed people on the Sabbath, as we studied earlier, that had been sick for 38 years, 30 years, and so on, all their life on the Sabbath. Yes. Well, one thing is sure. We should learn how to observe the Sabbath correctly because we're going to be doing it for the rest of eternity. And I read... Isaiah 66, on every New Moon Festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship before me here in Jerusalem. Our kind and loving Father, the Sabbath is a special privilege, a special honor that we have, and a delight if we worship on that day in the right ways with your presence, enjoying your presence. Help us to be able to correctly represent you in our observance of the Sabbath, and may we soon be able to celebrate it with you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen.